broader financial conditions, which in turn affect economic activity, employment, and inflation. Financial conditions have tightened significantly in recent months, and longer-term bond deals have been an important driving factor in this tightening. We remain attentive to these developments because persistent changes in financial conditions can have implications for the path of monetary policy. My colleagues and I remain resolute in our commitment to returning inflation to 2% over time. A range of uncertainties, both old ones and new ones, complicate our task of balancing the risk of tightening monetary policy too much against the risk of tightening too little. Doing too little could allow above target inflation to become entrenched and ultimately require monetary policy to wring more persistent inflation from the economy at a high cost to employment. Doing too much could also do unnecessary harm to the economy. Given the uncertainties and risks and given how far we've come, the committee is proceeding carefully. We will make decisions about the extent of additional policy firming and how long policy will remain restrictive based on the totality of the incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. Thank you. I look forward to our conversation, David. Thank you very much, Chair Powell, for being with us today for the remarks and for, for having a bit of a conversation here. We really appreciate it. It strikes me it's a particularly propitious time given everything that's going on in the world and in the economy. There's a lot to talk about, a lot to discuss. Let me start with something you just referred to, which is the surprise to the upside in the economic data, despite, as you termed it, I think, historically fast pace of growth. Are you surprised at how resilient the United States economy is. Just today, we got jobless claims numbers, surprised because they were low. We got the retail sales numbers you mentioned. We got industrial production. Across the board, it seems like a very strong economy, despite all you've done to try to slow it down. Yes, so uh, we certainly have a very uh, uh, resilient economy on our hands. We've got uh, the economy growing strongly. If you think back a year, many forecasts called for the US economy, economy to be in recession this year. Not only has that not happened, growth is now running for this year above its longer run trend. So that's been a surprise, driven largely by uh, consumer spending, driven by a very strong job market with uh, people getting jobs with high, first high nominal wages. And then as inflation has come down, real wages, which is spurring spending. And we've also had inflation coming down. So, you know, uh, that's it, it really is a story of much stronger demand. There may also be, there may be some ways in which the economy is um, less affected by interest rates. Uh, it's hard to know precisely, but for example, companies, many companies, any company with bond market access will have termed out its debt, right? And therefore may not be feeling the effects of higher rates. The same may be true of homeowners who have a, a long-term fixed rate, low rate mortgage, who then are therefore not because it's not an adjustable rate or a higher rate, they're not, they're not feeling that increase in rates. So the, the economy may be somewhat less uh, susceptible to the effects of rate increases. On the other hand, if you look at, um, look at interest sensitive spending, these are very much the, 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 um, the places where we, see, we, where we expect to see and do see effects. So for example, in, um, in housing or in, you know, the housing sector has been, sector's been very affected by higher rates as purchases of, of uh, durable goods. If you look at surveys, people will not say that it's a good time to buy a car or a house, quite the contrary. So we see policy working through its usual channels. It may just be that rates haven't been high enough for long enough. And, and again, it's all happening in a context of, of very strong demand. We've heard other people speculate maybe the terming out of debt, as you say, both corporate debt and household debt may diminish the effectiveness of rate hikes. Do you have a view on whether that's true? And if it is true, what does it say about monetary policy? Does it mean you have to go farther in the rate hikes or do you just not have the power to affect it? So no, I, I don't think that, that there's a, um, a fundamental shift in the way that interest rates affect the economy. There may be some differences in this cycle because of what I mentioned. Um, I, as I mentioned, you, we are seeing those, the effects where we expect to see them, which is interest sensitive spending and also asset prices to some extent. Uh, and the exchange rate, which you're also seeing a uh, strong exchange rate, which is which is disinflationary. So I don't think there's a, a fundamental change in the way monetary policy affects the economy. And again, it goes back to just very strong demand. 
we take the economy as it is. We take fiscal policy and the economy and all the things we don't control, they come to us and we conduct policy always to achieve maximum employment and stable prices. So we just take what comes. The fact that we have a strong growing economy, a strong growing labor market and uh, you know inflation coming down, these are the elements that we want to, to see that to achieve the, the outcome we want. It may take more time, but ultimately, uh, those are that's this is the kind of thing you would want to see along the path to getting through this without a big increase in unemployment. How much effect thus far has the Fed had? Uh, we, we all have memorized now long and variable lags. How long and how variable? And where are you in that process? Are you at the twenty five percent point, the fifty percent, in terms of seeing it in the effect in the real economy? So there's there's no precision in the uh, in in our understanding of of how long lags are. Um, one thing that has changed in the modern era is that markets now, uh, over the course of the last 30 years, central banks have decided instead of being secretive to be very transparent. And what that has meant is that markets move actually well in anticipation, well before our policy moves. So the transmission from policy moves to to financial conditions actually happens before the moves now, whereas that was not the case 50 years ago when Milton Friedman you know, coined the phrase long and variable lags. So, but now you have financial conditions changing and the question is how does it affect the economy? The standard channels are uh, asset prices, interest sensitive spending and the exchange rate, for example. And we, again, we do see that happening just not as fast as we would like. And I would attribute some of that to just stronger demand. You know, household savings were, were turned out to be higher. Household spending has been stronger, and that's by far the largest part of the economy. In order to conduct monetary policy effectively, do you need at least a, hypo a hypothesis about how much has already hit the economy? Because it's hard to know how much more you need to do if you don't know how far you've come. So on, on lags, I think if you think back, it's been a year since now since, since the last 75 basis point hike we did. It was at the November meeting in 2022. The first one was in June, so it's more than a year. So we should be seeing the effects by the way, they don't all just arrive on one day. They, they arrive and then they're thought to peak and then to diminish. So there's a lot of uncertainty around lags. Um, and one of the reasons why we have slowed down significantly this year is to give monetary policy time to work. The truth is though, you can find academic support for different, different speeds of, and, and duration of lag. So we have to use our eyes and a little bit of risk management in patience in slowing down the pace to make sure that we are seeing the full effects. And I think, again, that's that's part of why we've slowed down this year. We've, you know, we were we went very quickly in 2022 to catch up to where we needed to be, and now we're moving carefully with these decisions. Uh, so, when you spoke back in August of 2020 and sort of laid out the revisions to the framework, as it were. Uh, you said that in terms of anticipated growth, the sort of consensus had gone from something like 2.5 to 1.8 percent. I think were the numbers you laid out in that. Where are you now? Where's the Fed? Where are you? And what you think basically the long run growth is? Long run potential growth um, is not something that moves around a lot over time, but I would my my own guess is it's around two percent. I think that the, the standard mainstream view would be a little bit below two percent, but I would just say two percent real growth. Uh, over time. And, you know, what, what causes growth is, you know, growth in hours worked plus growth in productivity. Growth in hours worked is, is a function of population growth in the long run and also labor force participation. Many things affect productivity. But if you, if you drop in reasonable standard longer term estimates of hours worked growth and productivity, which is just output per hour, productivity growth, you get something around 2%. And that's that's higher than most other advanced economies. As you look at it, uh, do you see historical precedents for having a growing economy with high rates over a long period of time? I mean, as you look back, I mean, is it like the late 90s, for example? What, do you, what, what analogies do you draw as you try to determine what this might be doing at the economy over the longer term? So that that's really a question about what the, what the, what the, level of rates will be going for what the neutral level will be. And I think it's, it's very hard to know confidently what the answer to that will be in five years. Some of the reasons why rates were low for the last 25 years were just uh, the aging of the global population and globalization. And you know, so lots of savings and relatively uh, with an aging population, savings greater than investment, so rates are lower and productivity was low. So all of those led to low interest rates 
So what has changed with the pandemic? You might see less effects from globalization, certainly demographics, the, the aging of the global population has not changed. Um, I mean, this is a discussion we're having on an ongoing basis. It doesn't really affect the current policy, but where will rates settle out? What will be a, a normal rate? So if, if, the, if a typical Fed tightening cycle would leave you at five or six percent, and and this is this is in the before the pandemic and before the the low inflation period, you would have had had uh, Fed rates in four or five percent or even higher frequently. Are we going back to that? I really don't know. I wouldn't want to speculate. I mean, my guess is it'll be somewhere in the middle, but I I, I don't know. I mean, I think I think we can say this now: uh, the effect of lower bound is not an issue. You know, we were we were very concerned about that. Right now, we're very far from the effect of lower bound, and the economy's handling it just fine. But that's, you know, that's because we're at a time of, of really elevated demand uh, coming out of the pandemic as we reopened with fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus. We have very strong demand in the United States. Hard to know what, what the economy will want in the way of interest rates when, when five years from now, when all of the effects of the pandemic are behind us. You mentioned the long-term um, equilibrium rate, which you talked about again back in Jackson Hole in August of 2020. Back then you said you thought it had, the sort of consensus had come down I think it was from like 4.25% to 2.5%. Where is it today? <laughs> um, so I think it, by any reckoning, long-term interest rates and the neutral inter interest rate came down steadily over the course of several decades. So where is it today? I, I, I don't know. Uh, it, you know, we're, we're finding it uh, basically. Uh, the, the, the idea was, that I think the median indication of what the real neutral rate was around 50 basis points before the pandemic. It may have risen in the near term. The real question that, that matters, though, is will it rise in the long term? And that we don't know. But do you need to know it in order to conduct monetary policy? I mean, you must have to have at least a theory. I mean, I'm not saying you have to be right about it, but you have to have a hypothesis, don't you? As you look at the data, you have to put the data through some sort of uh, a theory. So we, we, we all write down our estimates of the longer run neutral rate every quarter in the summary of the economic projections. And, and that's based on models. It's based on also looking out the window and, and including lags, thinking how are our current rates affecting the economy? So the, the evidence of your eyes is that the economy is, is handling much higher rates, at least for now, without difficulty. So notionally, that, that might tell you that, that the neutral rate has risen, or it may just tell you that we haven't had rates high enough for long enough. Um, you're right though, but uh, you know, you, you, you have, we have models for everything. We have formulas for everything. Ultimately as a practitioner, mm -hmm. we have to you know, be focused on what the economy is telling us, even taking lags into account. What's it telling us? Does, does it feel like policy is too tight right now? I would have to say, no. I think the evidence is not that a policy is too tight right now. Um, so, and, and we're at five, five and a quarter to five and a half percent. Are, do you think we're entering into a new phase in monetary policy? We had the Volcker disinflation, I think you referred to it as, and then we had sort of inflation targeting for a time. Uh, there was concern about secular stagnation. We were pushing the zero bound, as you said, we were concerned about that. And then we had the pandemic and we had the, the real problem with inflation. What's the next phase look like? What, 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 how would you describe it? What we've been through is in, all of the advanced economies around the world was a period where the effect of lower bound, the, the proximity of interest rates, risk-free interest rates to the effect of lower bound, which is zero or a little bit less, was a big problem for monetary policy. And, and just rates came down and down and down. And the problem is if, if rates are gonna be close to zero in good times, then how do you cut? And so has, have central banks lost the power of their most important tool, which is interest rates? This was a subject of, of, a, of a vast literature in monetary policy research for 20 years. And, and you know, the, the, the most common answer was some kind of a makeup strategy. So you would credibly promise to, to run inflation a little bit hot and above 2%, and that would anchor inflation at 2% to counter the times when it was below. So that was a very serious problem, which filled books worth of research. Then comes the pandemic then comes the response to the pandemic, and then comes the pandemic inflation, not just in the United States, but everywhere. The question is, is that a secular change or are these, these factors that brought us to that place, are they still out there waiting to come back? And you know, books are written on this subject now. You, you can argue that, uh, and some have argued that, that effectively the last 20 years before the pandemic were kind of a perfect storm of disinflation. And now, 
that's all gone and we're going into a more inflationary period that will be characterized by more supply shocks and things like that and therefore more more inflationary pressure yeah and so are we going into such a I, I don't know i mean all, all i can tell you it, i think it's unknowable and you know great theorists and researchers have different views on this it's not it's not something you can settle in advance we'll have to see i think our our issue is right now trying to achieve a sufficiently restrictive stance of, of policy policy to bring inflation down two percent over time that's what we're really focused on whenever any of us go particularly institutions go through tumultuous times and goodness knows you've been through a tumultuous time uh we look back and think okay what do we learn sort of an after action report look at the pandemic and the pandemic uh, inflation what would you say you learned uh in terms of macroeconomics in terms of the economy from that experience so hindsight is is always a wonderful yeah. thing, right? Um, I think the fair way to judge the actions that were taken is uh, to put yourself in 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 the, the place of uh, of legislators and and policy other you know and, and central bankers around the world. And there was there was no playbook, you know. There were, we've never seen we hadn't seen a global economic shutdown. People were th were thinking that the pandemic might kill a whole lot of people and that we wouldn't have a vaccine for five years and we might not have an economy for five years. So these things were all very possible in March of 2020. And so we pulled out all the stops and Congress pulled out all the stops. With the benefit of hindsight, could we have done a little bit less and had a little bit of inflation? I guess we could. But I think if you look overall at the performance of the US economy, our, our economy is the strongest we we're the, we have the you know the we're, we're actually also making the most progress on inflation, but we certainly have the strongest growth. We're back to uh, prior growth trend, um, you know, not just level of where we were. We're actually back to the prior trend. Uh, the labor market. The last time we had uh, this many consecutive months of unemployment below four percent was in the late 1960s. So it's more than 50 years ago. So. Our economy is doing very well from all of that, but you know, if you had perfect hindsight, you might have, you might not have had as much inflation if we'd done less. Although other countries who didn't do as much as we did also had substantial inflation problems. I think my question was just a little bit different. It's not so much of assigning blame or saying that somebody make a mistake as are there things that going forward would change the way you conduct monetary policy that you learned from that, that maybe nobody had a reason to know at the time, but it was an experience you went through. Well, I, you know, we we were in a time of a very long time, in a reasonably long time, of disinflationary forces, and I think everybody's instinct had been attuned to risks coming from this direction, which is too low inflation. And so, what this has taught us is that the you know now the, now that that period that period is over, and we now have probably going forward a more balanced. Uh, set of risks where high inflation and low inflation are, are are both risks. In fact, right now the risk is still high inflation, but I'm, I'm assuming once we get back to two percent, we won't have that. But I, we've certainly learned that. And uh, I mean, you, 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 things, events are are the, the the possible range of events is so much wider than what he, what we think it is on any given day, right? The tails are so wide, and it's just not human nature to constantly be thinking about things that are way out in the tail, but they happen in, in financial markets and in economies. They, they happen far more regularly than, than they should. I suspect every person in this room is well aware of what's going on with yields with bonds. Uh, it's been a big story, particularly in the longer end of the curve. What is your understanding of what is going on in the bond market and why those yields are going up, particularly again at the longer end of the curve? So it's really, uh, it's really two questions. One is why is it happening? And, and the other is why does it matter for policy? And so I would say on the why is it happening question, I think it's appropriate to have a little bit of humility. It's always hard to say exactly what's going on with longer term yields, but, but this is what I think we can say. First, what it's not. It's not apparently about expectations of higher inflation. And it's also not mainly about shorter term policy moves. So Fed funds moves over the next year or two. Really, if you, you can look at the two year, for example, and two years moved up a little bit since September, but really the move is in longer run bonds. So it's really happening in term premiums, which is the compensation for holding longer run securities and not principally a function of the market looking at, at, at near term fund rate. I think other, uh, other, a few other ideas about, there are many candidate ideas and, uh, and many people feeling their priors have been confirmed by this event, I'll say as well. 
But um, so one would be just that uh, markets and analysts are seeing the resilience of the economy to high interest rates, and they're they're revising their view about the the overall strength of the economy and thinking even longer term this may require higher rates. That could be part of it. Uh, you know, there may be a heightened focus on fiscal deficits. That could be part of it. QT could be part of it. Uh, another one you hear very often is the change, changing correlation between bonds and equities. If we're going forward into, if we are going forward into a world of more supply shocks rather than demand shocks, that could make bonds a, a less attractive hedge to equities, and therefore you need to be paid more to own bonds, and therefore the term premium goes up. So all, all of those uh, uh, are, are possible ideas. Then, then the question is, does it matter for us? As long as I'm talking about this, so. Um, the way I think about it is, uh, you know, we change our policy. Actual and expected changes in our policy affect uh, financial conditions, and persistent changes in financial conditions affect economic activity, hiring, and inflation. So, one question is: Are we seeing the longer-run bonds? Are they the increases in in rates? Are we seeing those come through in financial conditions in a persistent way? And I think if you look at financial conditions indexes. The answer so far would be yes, you are. Uh, persistence, it will be a matter of, of, of just seeing with our own eyes, but certainly they're coming. If you look at financial conditions indexes, they're showing tightening and it's a lot because of longer rates. Then the question is, is it endogenous? And is it just, is it just because the market expects us to take things, to, to, to take further actions to, to, uh, to tighten monetary policy, in which case if you have to follow through. But that doesn't seem to be the case. It, it, is, it doesn't seem to be principally about expectations of us doing more. It seems to, that the other factors are the more, uh, the more prominent ones. Another question is... Bottom, bottom line, though, that, that means it probably does over time. It makes sense. It's something that we'll be looking at. Well, that, that's the question I was asking, over time. It, it, from what you understand right now, do you think this is a temporary phenomenon? Or do you think there are structural factors, whatever they are, and we can talk about what they might be, that would really, are, uh, this is the future that we're looking at now. So of the factors I just listed, some of them are shorter term, some of them are longer term, and some of them could be either. So for example, fisc concerns over fiscal deficits, uh, that, that could be a longer term factor. The, the, the change in, in correlations between stocks and bonds could be a long term. I, I don't think we know. I think, um, you know, basically bond prices are set by supply and demand. The supply of, of treasuries is, is, a, is a known thing, but demand can be affected by any and all of these theories and also just by sentiment, sentiment too, which is hard to characterize. So, you know, markets have been volatile. They've been uh, longer, you, you know, you've seen the uh, rates moving up and down a lot. I think we have to let this play out and watch it. Uh, but, we, you know, for now, it, it looks, it's, it's clearly a tightening in financial conditions. And so we'll be watching it carefully. Talking about the fiscal side, and you've been very careful repeatedly to say you want to stay in your lane, you're not responsible for fiscal issues. At the same time, you have to take into account, and it looks like the United States is going to have to borrow a fair amount of money. By the way, other countries are as well around the world. We have a, a big, a big supply of treasuries coming on board. Uh, to what extent do you think that is a longer term issue? And let me tie it back to something you referred to in your remarks, actually. When we see geopolitical conflict around the world, like in Israel, like in Ukraine, some of the buildup with respect to China, the defense spending is going to be elevated for the United States and for other countries. Do you take that into account in figuring monetary policy? Because it may well mean that we're borrowing a lot more money than we have in the past. So we, of course, see the same, same things that everyone else. I just came back from IMF meetings this weekend, and there's a lot of talk of the very large resource demands that organizations like the IMF and, and of course, countries are facing and the need for substantial amounts of revenue. You mentioned military. There's also dealing with, with climate change and things like that. So it's a, there, there's a lot of that. Um, we don't, uh, as you mentioned, we don't comment on, on uh, fiscal policy. Actually, the fiscal authorities have oversight over us and not the other way around. So we, we stay away from that. Um, so I, I, I would just say everyone knows that it's not a secret. And about all I can say is we know that we're on an unsustainable path fiscally. It's not that the level of the debt is unsustainable. It's not. It's that where the path we're on is unsustainable, and we'll have to get off that path sooner rather than later. It's not really something, though, that affects a, a monetary policy decision about whether how much we raise rates in the next six months. It's not. It's not going to be driven by. Um, uh, it, I mean, if there were some vast new fiscal 
policy that were about to be enacted. And then that, that would have an effect on the models and would have an effect on projections and indirectly that would affect us. But we would not be in a position of responding directly to fiscal policy. When we talk about the treasury market, obviously there's, there's buying and selling. Uh, and the United States government is issuing a lot of treasuries. There's also a question of who's buying. And we're, we now have one buyer who stepped out of the marketplace, namely the Fed, which is a big buyer. And at the same time, we're getting reports that maybe some of the overseas buyers uh, may be pulling back as well. How do you take that into account in, in, in assessing where we're going with long-term bond yields? So actually, um, uh, I think buying by overseas uh, entities has actually been pretty robust this year. So there have been some small changes, but I think by and large, it's been it's they've they've been buying. Uh, you know, robustly. Again, we look at we look at the broad financial conditions. We look at interest rates, other asset prices. That's what we look at. We're not we we're not um, you know we don't focus on fiscal policy. We wouldn't change monetary policy because because of uh, for example if, uh, you know because we think that the U.S. is on an unsustainable path. Everyone knows that um, we're just going to do monetary policy to achieve maximum employment and stable prices. Uh, and that's how we think about it. I, I'm curious, though, um, one of the things you're most concerned about is the real economy, what's going on in the real economy. You distinguish yourself from some of your predecessors in that you have a significant exposure to the private sector, not just the public sector, academics. As you talk to CEOs, people in business, uh, what are you hearing about the cost of capital? Because these bond prices are really affecting cost of capital uh, for the first time in a while. There was a long time the cost of capital felt like it was almost zero. And business changes an awful lot when you really when the price of money goes up. I talked to several people this week who run companies, and they each said that the economy remains strong, and that they don't see the consumer. You know, you see, it, 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 there's some areas where 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 spending is softening, but overall, I mean, look at the retail sales number. The consumer is strong. Um, uh, Volume is not going up very much, but but uh, companies are profitable. You don't, you know. Now, if you get to where I think the cost of capital would really matter would be for smaller companies and and early stage companies, and that really does matter. So we, you know, we don't have a lot of tools. We have interest rates, and they're far from perfect. Perfect. It's famously a blunt tool, mm -hmm. but it's what we have to get uh, uh, inflation down. And and really, the world counts on us to deliver. Uh, low and stable inflation. That's what we have to do. And you know, at a time like this, there are you know we know that we're having negative effects on you know we had the home builders in this week. It's a very tough time in the whole home building industry, mm -hmm. and uh, we know that. Uh, but ultimately, what we want to get back to is a long period of price stability. That's the best thing we can provide, and that that for policymakers and businesses and everyone can, and people can, can just lead their lives not worrying about inflation. This is what we can deliver. It's what we have to deliver. And this is the time, you know, our independence is, is not for times when we're really popular. It's for when we're now, when we're doing something that, that, that really the public counts on us to do, notwithstanding that it's, that it's challenging and difficult. And, and, you know, higher interest rates are difficult for everybody. You have not wavered from your commitment to 2%. You did it again today, 2%. No question about it. There are those who suggested, including some colleagues in the Fed, that maybe the bond market is doing part of your job for you. Is that the way you see it? I, look, I would, I would say it this way. Um, the whole idea of, of uh, tightening policy is to affect financial conditions. And to the extent higher bond rates reflect, they, they do. They're producing tighter financial conditions right now. So that is, that's how monetary policy works. That's literally how it works. So. Again, in principle, as long as they're, as long as uh, bond rates are going up, for the for some reasons, and they're not going up just because they expect us to do things. So that if we don't do them, they'll come right back down. As long as, and we don't think that's the case. Actually, it doesn't I don't think it's the case. It's, it doesn't seem to me that's that's what that, where analysis leads you. Then sure, that's a tightening. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve. And therefore, it seems like almost arithmetic. It must reduce some of the impetus for you to continue to raise rates. At the margin, it could. I mean, it, I think that remains to be seen. By the way, I'm not blessing any particular level of longer term rates, We're, but just in principle, that's right. Uh, so let's talk about the labor market. Uh, you referred to that in your remarks as well. Uh, and as you say, vacancies have come down some, although they still are pretty elevated, if I'm not mistaken. Quits have actually gone up some. It seems to be a tight labor market. What do you make of what's going on in the labor market right now? 
labor market has been extraordinarily strong. So what happened in the pandemic was we had a negative labor supply shock is one way to think about it. So a whole lot of people left the labor market when the pandemic happened and then didn't come back. And so when the economy reopened and everybody, you know, there was, remember there was revenge travel and revenge everything, uh, very strong demand and, and there just weren't the people. So you had two job openings for every person actively seeking employment. We've never been anywhere near close to that. There was panic that, you know, and wages and bonuses and particularly in things like uh, in-person services where people had not gotten big wage increases and didn't wanna come back to work. So that's, that's where we were. So since then, there are very many signs that the labor market is getting back into balance. And I talked about some of that in my remarks. Uh, surveys of work, you know, we survey businesses. We don't do it, but other people survey businesses and say, are workers plentiful? And that measure, that measure was no, but now it's back to pre-pandemic levels. You survey workers, are jobs plentiful? And that was at an all-time high, and now it's still high, but back. So wages are, wage increases are coming back down to more normal levels. Job openings are down from 2 to 1.4. They were at 1.2 in the, in the very tight labor market of 2019. By, so, by you know, the, the work week, by so many measures, the labor market is gradually cooling. And part of that is this, all through 2022, we thought we were going to get more labor supply, and we didn't. And I personally thought, well, I guess we won't get any. And then we've gotten a substantial amount this year. The, the labor, female labor force participation is at an, in, in prime age workers is at an all-time high, which has to be related in, in some way to uh, work from home. But labor force participation increased, immigration increased, and now you, you see that in, in the overall cooling of the labor market. So even though job creation is still very high, there are the workers to fill those jobs. And again, businesses will tell you it's, that it's very different. It's still a very tight labor market, but it's, it's loosening. Coming back to your goal of 2% inflation, what have you learned from this experience about the relationship between inflation and labor? I mean, there's a lot of talk about Phillips curve, whether it still applies, whether it's weaker, what is it? What, what is your hypothesis right now with the relationship between inflation and labor market? Let me tell you what, what it was before. So um, one of my favorite charts is just the slope of the Phillips curve over 40 years. And so it shows the relationship between unemployment and inflation. If you go back to the high inflation of the 70s, it was a very tight relationship. And that relationships went down and down and down to the effect where the Phillips curve, there was almost no relationship, meaning uh, the, the, the Phillips curve was very, very flat. Um, now, actually, if you just ignore cause and just look at the data, it will tell you that, that the relationship is back. Do we really think that's a sustainable thing? I don't know. What, what happened though was that people, people came to seriously expect 2% inflation, something like 2% inflation, and if people expect that, if companies expect it and workers expect it and you expect that in your shopping, then that's what will happen in, in a way. And that's what that's what happened. So even in very, very tight labor markets, we didn't have high inflation. I was at the Fed since 2012 as unemployment went from six to five to four into the threes for the first time. And, you know, the models were all saying that we should be seeing some inflation. And we never saw we never really saw two percent inflation on a sustained basis during that era. So we learned that the Phillips curve was really flat. Some pronounced it dead. Um, now, uh, I, I don't think most of the inflation we're seeing at all is from, is from the Phillips curve though. I think it was built really the collision of very strong demand, really strong demand with, with constrained supply. Cars being a great example. Many people wanted cars, didn't want to ride public transportation, wanted to move to the suburbs. You know, unlimited demand for cars, interest rates are low yet we couldn't get semiconductors. So there are no more cars. Car production went down. How do you solve that problem? Prices just go way, way up for cars. That's how you clear the market. So that's, that's a classic example of what happened here. It really wasn't about the Phillips curve. It was more about constrained supply and demand more broadly, especially for goods at the beginning. Let's turn to another responsibility of yours, which is the banking system. Last March, we had something of a scare because of, I guess, interest rate risk with Silicon Valley Bank and then some others. Uh, are, are we through that now? Where are we in that process? Are you, are you resting easy? So what you pay us for is not to rest easy. Um, it, we, uh, we, we don't do that. Uh, so, but I would say where we are is this, though. Things have certainly settled down, certainly have settled down. Um, we see the funding markets is fine. We see, and, and you know, we, we, we paid a lot of attention to banks that, that looked anything like the banks that had the problems. 
and made sure that they that they had credible liquidity plans and plenty of liquidity and and all of that. And so I think all of that has worked. And we we set up this facility that's available to, for banks to borrow. And so all of that has led to a real settling down. But you know our job is to be on the case, and you know we're still on the case, and uh, we'll um, you know we'll we'll keep after that. Um, Banks are generally very well capitalized and highly liquid in our country. Banks are strong. You know, we benefit from all those years of reform under Dodd Frank and, and Basel III that we went through. Uh, you know, with former Governor Tarullo right. uh, and uh, and many others. Right. And so we benefit from a very strong, well capitalized uh, banking system that's much better at managing its risks than the one that entered the global financial crisis. Very well capitalized, but you want some more. This You're is the proposal, the Basel III proposal, which is, you know, it's a, it's a rule that's out for comment. So there's not a lot I can say, but we do expect a lot of comment and we do expect to take those comments very seriously. Talk about the commercial real estate. Uh, there are some concerns out there in the marketplace of what's going on, because obviously there's a repricing that comes with your increased rates. Uh, it's thought that there's some real estate out there that is not the, worth the money that was originally financed with it. Uh, how concerned should we be about that as something lurking out there that could really affect the system overall, not just the people invested. So there's work from home and, and that's affecting downtown real estate in a lot of big cities and um, uh, higher rates as well, as you point out. So this is, this is an issue that we pay a great deal of very careful attention to. Uh, commercial real estate is not a, is not a principal risk or, or a, a major risk for the very large, largest banks. Right. It is much more for uh, regional and, and really, the, really the smaller banks have, have proportionally much larger exposure to real estate, so commercial real estate. So what we've done is supervisors are in there looking at re real estate portfolios. They're working with banks to make sure that they have, they have plans to deal with the problems they have in their portfolio. These, uh, these problems evolve over time. They don't, they don't land with great suddenness like a market event. And so we're working with all of the bank regulators are working with uh, banks that have you know, concentrations of troubled real estate to work it out. Um, there will be losses for sure. Uh, you can drive down through most downtowns, in many downtowns anyway, and see uh, buildings that are empty and things like that. But we're, we're working through it uh, and you know, we're on that case and, and don't see it as, uh, you know, as presenting much broader problems, but our job is to make sure that it doesn't. As you mentioned, regional banks are where a lot of people focus on this. As you conceptualize, the banking system. What is the role of the regional banks? We have the super big banks that don't look like they're going anywhere. And we've got the community banks, the smaller banks that we understand are critical, for, particularly for small businesses and local context. But what about the regional banks? How much pressure is there on them? And what would the, would the damage be to the system if in fact there was more consolidation with some of the big banks? I think the regional banks are very important, extremely important. You know, We, are, we have 4,500 banks, which is a lot more than any other country per capita or per dollar of GDP. But we have, you know, our, our GSIBs, the largest banks are the leading banks in the world in profitability and in their success in their business. We have community banks in, in, in you know, who deal in, in smaller communities. But we also have these great regionals. And I think they do, they do a, a great business among, you know, with, with many companies. And uh, I, I do think their business model is under pressure. And I would not like to see us add to that by treating them exactly like like GSIBs, I think they need they don't need exactly the same attention that a GSIB gets. So, but I, I would say we, we I personally think, and I think we at the Fed strongly think that that the that the regionals and the smaller regionals are, are an enormously important part of our banking system. Okay, you've been very generous with your time. Really appreciate. It. I have one last question. Are you having a good time? <laughs> <laughs> You mean if now, so, why? Now or, or? No, no, no. <laughs> I assume this wasn't that pleasant, but in general, you're enjoying your job. <laughs> I would say this. First of all, it's, it's an incredible honor to do this job. And every day I do it, I feel so fortunate and so lucky and blessed to be entrusted with this. And, uh, you know, all I want to do is do the best job I can for the public that we all serve. Uh, and yes, there's, there's a lot that is enjoyable about it, but mostly it's just uh, so important to get it right. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you so much, Chair Powell. It's really good of you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.
Well, let me just conclude with four thank yous. Uh, first, thanks to the team from the Economic 